Hey guys, welcome to Enhancing Operational Efficiency with our fantastic customer, Brightsight. Today, we're going to be talking through their journey, pros, cons, lessons learned, um, and we'll be joined by our fantastic panelists that will conduct a Q&A in a second. Before we get there, we just do want to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of our land. The Gadigal of the Eora Nation are the traditional custodians of this place we now call Sydney. This week we're celebrating what we're calling WorksFest, a real festival of the minds, um, hosting some fantastic sessions around Cloudworks's point of view um, on our take of the future of how you should adopt and some fantastic use cases of the platforms we implement. Um, we've had some great sessions on Monday, some more sessions today, and at the end of the session, we'll be sharing a QR code. We'd love you to register for our sessions tomorrow um, and on Thursday afternoon. So please, if there's some sessions that you're interested in, we'd love you to jump in and love to uh, get you to join in in what we call WorksFest. Today, we're talking with Brightside, but we really wanted to um, cover off and, you know, Jared and Jackson will cover this, but we deal with people and customers with lots of different types of maturity. Do we customers looking to justify the investment in a new platform, which can sometimes be daunting? So like, what is the first use case? How do you get going? Um, we work with customers laying a foundation, foundation. So, you know, I've made that investment in a platform, but how do I reach out and engage my different business units um, and build the, the use cases and business cases? For getting more adoption across my business. Once I've got that, how do I scale up, automate, create some more efficiency, um, which is really key to why you invested in the first place. And then, you know, there are more mature customers that have earmarked sort of strategic platforms for different use cases, um, and they've got a platform approach. So when a, when a requirement comes in from the business, they look at what platform might be the best to, to use um, and implement that use case on. Um, they've got some strict governance around, you know, this is this type of use case, we're gonna use Salesforce for that. Um, and we build that into, you know, our, our release plan and future future releases. Um, got a friend who refers to, you know, special app purchases as the Audi special buys. And that's really what, you know, as a business you wanna to try to avoid, avoid extra integrations and extra complexity. Um, so we're here today to talk to someone who's sort of been through that journey, um, hopefully avoided some Audi special buys and got some great value out of a platform they're working with. Um, Jared's been working with them over the last couple of years. So might pass to you, sir, um, to introduce yourself and Jackson. And once you've done that, I will kill the slides and we can get into the Q&A. <laughs> um, so Jared, client partner at Cloudworks, uh, been here for almost four years and uh, been working with Brightside for almost three, I think. Um, Jackson, what about you? Thanks, Jared. My name is Jackson. I'm Head of Projects and Solutions at Brightside. Um, I, I live up on the sunny Sunshine Coast in, in Queensland and I've been working um, with Brightside for a number of years on, on platform development and, um, and improvements to our business. And we uh, stumbled across uh, each other's paths a couple of years back, as, as Jared had said, which was, um, which was, which was good timing. So question number one, uh, just like, you know, thousands of other businesses in Australia or more than millions globally, Brightside is not a household may have come into contact with, but um, we haven't, uh, not everybody knows it. Can you tell us a bit about what, who is Brightside? What do you do? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the, the long-winded answer is Brightside is an administrator of, embedded device insurance and extended warranty uh, products that we operate in a number of different countries around the globe. Um, the typical kind of process is customer goes into a retail store, buys a, buys a product that might be bricks and mortar or online, uh, and they're offered an additional piece of cover that might be accidental damage type cover or, or some kind of warranty extension. Um, through the life of, of, of that cover, the customer has an issue that relates to that type of cover they have. They get in touch with, with us either via the retailer directly or, or to us directly. Uh, and then we go about the process of assessing that issue to determine if there's a problem. 
uh, and, we, and we can then provide that customer with an appropriate remedy based on the cover that they've purchased. Um, so cool. So I'm a, I've got a big box retailer, buy a brand new TV, take it home. Two weeks later, stops working. Um, I've purchased the additional insurance on top of the in initial warranty. Chances are I call back my big box retailer. Um, someone like Brightside or, or Brightside themselves are actually uh, off, uh, are, are the, the people I'm dealing with to either get it fixed or get it replaced or have a repair or turn up at the house. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we have our network of service agents who then we allocate to that particular case. They go out, do the assessment, tell us what the issue is, and then we come up with a with a resolution. And obviously, we're here in Australia, but um, you're 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 pretty broad, right? Like Brightside covers a decent chunk of our planet. Yeah, absolutely. We're we're I think we're pretty close to double digits in in countries that we operate now, um, and that's all over the world in in every manner of time zone and currency and language you can think of. Yeah, a bit of like a bit of an Aussie success story, then I guess you could say. Yeah, I reckon. Um, so that's Brightside's kind of business model. What about you? What's your role, and how long you've been there for, and um, what, yeah, what's your what's your most recent role? Yeah, so um, my my team is the Projects and Solutions team, and so ultimately, what we do is we we get requests um, from all of our regional stakeholders, and that might be for a new business opportunity. We're going to roll out a new product, or there could be uh, additional enhancements whether their system or process enhancements based on a certain initiative that's that's occurring at any point in time and so we uh, pick up that requirement engage um, our development qa teams put a solution together and ultimately see it through to delivery um, you know it's a bit of a it's an interesting one where we have each of those individual regions has their own requirements whether they're kind of regional legal requirements or or other quirks uh, and when we get those, the goal for us is to look at that and say, okay, how do we make this as reusable as possible so that it, so that everyone can get the benefit out of it? We don't try and build specifically to requirements. Otherwise, we um, we end up kind of in urban sprawl territory. So it's a big part just trying to maintain the the overall kind of integrity of the product that way. Mm. So like a real shared, serv a a shared services team for a global network, really. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So a few years ago, we, we came into contact um, via a process that Brightside was running. Um, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you can remember then um, the, the time we met and, you know, obviously apart from being kind of overwhelmed by my um, charm and good looks, can you remember much about the, the uh, reason, I guess, Brightside were going out and talking to vendors like Cloudworks and Salesforce? Yeah. So, so this business has existed in a few different guises for, for many, many years. 30 plus years um, and we'd, we'd, we'd built an existing uh, internal platform that was almost completely bespoke and maintained by our by our internal teams. We'd gotten a bunch of the really complicated stuff right, which was which was which was great, but some of the simple stuff over time, the product was aging, it was harder to maintain probably a similar story to a lot of people. Uh, we had picked up a new opportunity in, in another region um, where we needed to get to market really quickly. And our existing platform wasn't fit for purpose for a couple of really obvious reasons, like being able to run the application in a language other than English was something that we couldn't really do very well. Uh, and so we kind of reached out, um, had a look around at the market and said, right, what, what, what can we do? We need to get something up and running pretty quickly for this very specific uh, use case. And, and that's how we stumbled across you guys. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that, that what you actually built was super sophisticated. It was a pretty amazing platform and in a, in a way i guess you could say brightside product is its platform right like you can do all these things for all these regions and the system had been built up over time to um, accommodate lots of different requests from lots of different areas of the world and um you know big box retailers etc uh and uh yeah i feel like it's a, a really interesting use case of when we met it was can you do all of this but can you do this bit really quickly? Um, I think we might have had, you know, we called a pilot or a POC um, to to get something. And I guess the, the the challenge was if it can work quickly and seamlessly here, but also future looks like it can do all these other things. You know, we'd give you give you a shot. Um, obviously, we're talking today, so fast forward 
sorry to you know, tell the ending of the movie, but <laughs> you chose Cloudworks and you chose Salesforce and your software integration, I should say, um, to be the platform of choice. But going back to that time as, as almost like a chief product officer, chief product owner, I like to consider you, um, you, you helped build an amazing solution and now you're out there in the market going, how do I rebuild this, but on a different stack and maybe more scalable, et cetera, but without putting words in your mouth, what were you looking for apart from some speed to get something yeah. for this particular new, new, new region? What were the things as, as a product person that you thought were going to be important as you went out to market? And I, I say that because heaps of people on, on watching this now and lots of my customers and prospects are doing exactly the same thing today. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I think the, the, the challenge, as you rightly called out, we had a platform, it was working, um, though there were some cracks starting to appear and we, we knew that it was time to do, to do something, you know, the challenge for anyone that's done a, you know, a decade of in-house work is that there are, there's a, there's an urban sprawl, no matter how, no matter how much you control it, there's an element of things kind of spreading out and you need to, not necessarily take those things away when you're looking for a new platform. So we really needed something that we could build on for the next 10 years or so. Um, one of the things that we didn't get with our existing platform is just a lot of free stuff. So just some really simple out of the box stuff, you know, like being able to send an email really easily. We had that functionality, but we had to maintain it, work on it, all those kind of things. Um, so we also really needed some flexibility, I guess, to, to, to rebuild and retain some of those really cool things that were ours. Um, a lot of what we had built was really bespoke to us. It wasn't wrong. It just, it did exactly what we wanted it to do. We didn't want to lose that by moving across to a new platform. Um, so really being able to continue to extend ourselves, but also be able to maintain the platform ourselves moving forward was important. Um, in order to achieve that, we kind of needed a, to find a partner that was going to help us build that but also kind of bring us forward on our journey so that we would be able to become salesforce proficient through that through that process uh, and that was important as well and ultimately put it all together we needed to get it done real quick because we had a specific use case that that needed to get live um very quickly yeah yeah it was a funny timing wasn't it it was like we need to rebuild this whole thing which is huge and a fair bit of it's quite unique but um I think you had four weeks to make a decision and and we had to get get cracking. Well, I think obviously things have gone pretty well and we'll get we'll get into some of the results. Um, uh, but it's certainly you know been a journey. Um, what made you choose, I guess Salesforce and what in as your platform? And I think you, you know there was no Salesforce in the business where we met you, just a little bit of Neilsoft which we were able to. Um, grow over the journey and I think that was an interesting one like the right integration tool was, was also on the table um, but what made you choose Salesforce I guess and then second second to that um, and, and we're only a Salesforce partner so if you had a chosen something else by default we would have not worked together but what made you um, you know look at Cloudworks as well that without pumping up my tires of course our <laughs> tires you know, what was important as a partner choice as well as a platform choice? Yeah, so look, it was, it was absolutely it was a massive decision for us. And, and certainly as a as a business, the, the kind of technology transformation that we're talking about is a is a once in a decade plus type thing, you know, at, 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 at most, right? So that was that was really, you know, something that we took really seriously. Um, again, we, we mentioned it before, but timing timing was was tricky when it came to the fact that we needed to get this thing out the door real quickly to, mm. to, to kind of make it, to bring an opportunity to life. Um, we were really happy with the proof of concept that, um, that, 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 that you and the Cloudworks team put together because it sort of demonstrated that, yes, we can do this. We don't, we don't need um, to continue working on our, on our existing platform. This is, this is a path forward for us. And that was, that was probably a big moment, I guess. Um, so once we had that, that, that POC, effectively in production um we decided that yes okay this is this is a path forward and we uh and we went through a short rfp process um that ultimately you guys were successful to to to, to doing the the rest of the world rollout and and what we were um you know the the thing that we wanted to be able to do is we wanted to be able to build fast which we knew that we could do um, but also we just needed to 
know that we would able be able to continue to have those customizations that we had enjoyed previously on our on our own platform. Uh, and what we saw in Salesforce was the ability to get the simple stuff right quickly, but also uh, still retaining that almost limitless ability to customize for areas where a particular business needs it. Yeah, like 100%. And, and in the financial services space or really any space, like what you want to do is is push a customer to use what's standard and what Salesforce gives you, whether it's for financial services or retail and commerce or health or whatever, there's, there's clouds available. But no one is so standard that they don't have those things about them that, that need some sort of extra configuration or customization. I've seen it, Reese, you've seen it over the years that that's why Salesforce seems to be so powerful is, is you kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, what I love about Brightside's, I guess, use case, like you're in insurance, yeah, but you have this network of partners and retailers and, and uh, fixer-uppers or repairers and replaces out there that these portals that you have, these like, um, which are quite sophisticated, but also just the reach of the multi-language, multi-currency. Talk us a bit about, you know, how, how some of the improvements you've seen from a technology or a process standpoint around the claims process and the use of these kind of self -port self-service portals. Yeah. So interestingly, um, we did have some element of, so I should go back as far as, the, the, our stakeholders that use our self-service portals, we obviously have our, our customers' customers, direct end customers who can log into a portal and check the status of their claim or... So that's me with my TV, waiting to see, like, yeah. are you going to give me a new one? Is it going to be fixed? I'm logging in and, and it's branded, right? Like it's branded, whether it could be a bright side brand, but it could be branded the retailer we'll itself. We'll brand it to the retailer so that it's a seamless experience. And that's, you know, one of the reasons that the, the bright side name isn't as well known because we sort of sit in behind it and it's the and, and it's the retailer that um that typically we brand as because that's the experience that the that the customer is expecting. So we have those guys. Um the service agents which we've already spoken about need to log into our self-service portal to upload their assessments um and and invoices and other bits and pieces. The actual retail stores themselves can log in and check in on things on behalf of their customers. And we also have some use cases for our insurers who are ultimately the the, the very back of the house where um, they they kind of underwrite the whole thing and and, and are a very important part of, of our ecosystem. Mm. And they can um, get like a macro look as well, can't they, on how they're the absolutely. holistic policies versus claims versus... And sometimes there's decisions that they need to make too. So so that that's kind of operationally embedded in into the process now, which is good. But we had some of those things already. We had an element of a service agent portal in our existing platform, and that was that was working more or less. Um, though each of those systems was kind of completely independent from all the others. And so if we wanted to build something in both, we had to do it twice or um other other kind of types of complexity that come out of that. And one of the one of the anecdotes I share was one of the things when we talked through those self-service portals with our internal stakeholders was one of the questions was asked, yes, but how long does it take for the data to sync back? Uh, and that was just purely based on the existing experience of, you know, existing systems would sync data between each other and all those kind of things, which um, certainly works. But the question was asked because this was a, this, this was a different platform and the reality of those self-service portals in Salesforce is that it's one set of data. It's all based on the same database and a change made in one portal is immediately visible in the other. Uh, and so that's just, a, you know, something that maybe gets taken for granted, but was certainly something, a, a little thing that made a difference to our, to our internal stakeholders. That they and, well, over, and over time, I guess for you guys who manage the platform, less integration is the better, right? Like if you can, integrations are a necessary thing in all systems but if you can limit them to the absolute necessary that more easily maintained right that system and we'd, for sure we'd use integrations to integrate from our left hand to our right hand i guess um which which is maybe not not something that's certainly what we've experienced today is no longer necessary and then we just save integration for what's actually for which is to integrate with external entities that are on completely separate platforms so we spend our integration dollars now more on dealing with service agents and retailers and insurers uh, as we should mm -hmm. and those um what did you what have you learned about reusability since you've kind of 
jumped on the Salesforce kind of bandwagon. But I'm thinking internal components, but more external components. Like we talk about the the customer facing or the server service agent facing portals. Um, we've spent a lot of time looking at componentry, right? Like what what's the best bang for buck, and how can we reuse these things? Like is that has that been a, an exciting part or an important part of the journey? Certainly, you know, if you look at the way we've the way we've tackled that, we've kind of given, you know, our service agent network has a varied kind of um, level of integration with us. Um, some of those service agents that use our service agent portal will submit their assessments via the portal, no problem. But some of them might make a phone call, call in or email us, for example. Uh, and our internal claims team members will actually submit that assessment report on behalf of the service agent who sent it to us, but they're using the same componentry, right? So one of them's using the self-service portal to submit their assessment. The other one's using the internal platform to submit it, but it's the exact same component. We only had to build one of them. And so things like that, where previously we probably had to do that twice, just by way of example, and that's one of many, we only have to do that once now. Yeah. Yeah, so we're talking about the self-service portals and I, I've loved some of the, the, the demos I had over the over the years where you know it, it sounds simple i guess now but being able to log in from a different country means your currency and your language is just different automatically whereas i guess you mentioned at the start that's one of the custom things that were hard to replicate that salesforce offers um its users and you know be able to clone and rebrand and, and all that kind of stuff i think there's just so many benefits there but from a service agent point of view, what were some of the benefits? What what are some of the benefits or the benefits to yeah. the team that you've started to see? Well, the service agents, I think, um, again, the fact that they we can kind of customize how we deal with them based on their the volume that they do, the level of engagement we have, their technical um, integration capabilities. So we can start, you know, at the at the the simplest one of, hey, we're just going to send you jobs and you can just email us in your quotes, no problem. Then we move on to the portal if that's what you want to do because that, you know, we get the benefit of some automation around being able to provide you faster turnarounds on approvals and things like that. And then for the for the ones, for for, for the service agents that, that have the interest, we've built out our own service agent API integration. So if they want to, they can build that based on our specification. And then it's a completely seamless experience for their internal users when they're submitting their assessment in their own system, it comes through to us automatically. So I think have, having that kind of, I always think of it as like a menu list and say, which, you know, here's, our, here's what we've got available, which one do you want? Makes that a bit easier to kind of onboard new service agents into, into that network. And the same thing goes for retailers as well, where we need to get um, data from them in, in, with regard to customer purchases that we need to cover and that might be done via b2b integration or it could be done via file exchange or or a few other different methods and we just choose whatever whatever makes the most sense for that particular opportunity and make that happen so really i guess it's just having the flexibility to integrate with um, a bunch of different people via a bunch of different means has made has made things a bit easier for us um, and as a business that is you grow by new new business essentially like you, you you go to a new region or a new retailer or a new insurer that, that you work under it must be your your sales team or business development team i know having spoken to them by having this like bag of tricks or set or options means it's a lot easier you're a lot more enticing as a new as a as a company to work with like we have this we have that we have that which which benefits you which which is the model that your customers want we can do all three of those things and it's already built, right? Like you can uh, service those requirements more easily. I think the, 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 the challenge and what we've tried to get right with that is again, trying to avoid building to requirement for, for a specific use case as best we can to think about how we could do 5% extra to get 20% more benefit. So the big thing for us, when we look at our, our kind of product, overall is we're trying to build it like a like a toolbox right and 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 next time we we do another rollout we're trying to add a new tool to the toolbox that we can pick up and reuse later should we need to sorry I disappeared um so we've talked about service agents what about your clients like your end clients like what are some of the things that 
Now, I'm not trying to over exaggerate here, Jackson Reese, people listening, um, that this is the perfect system and all the problems of the world have gone away. I think it, it has been a journey, and we'll get to some of the challenges sure. in a second. And I'm not saying that everything is perfect, but um, I think a lot of the benefits are to come now that you're st it's stable and working and, and global and et cetera, et cetera. But some of the benefits to the client just by the, the, the newer features on newer technologies, can you give us a, a summary of some of those? Visibility is a big one. So for all of those, and and you know we have a we have a varied definition of customer. But there's there's the retail customers, the service, you know, all all those external stakeholders. But but just clearer visibility of what's happening is um is reassuring for um for someone out there who's got an issue with the product or more more they need you know an update or whatever. So um, making sure that those portals are always up to date with the latest information is is really critical. Um, so that's that's the that's the customer benefit. Um, I'd probably also say, uh, and it took us a little while to get going. You know, moving on to a new platform, there were some challenges just overall with regard to efficiency because we went from a very old platform to a very very new one that that you know had some had some challenges in the early days. But certainly now that we've been on platform for a little while now, um, we're certainly starting to see some efficiency gains in the actual processing. Um, of those of those outcomes for customers, and and the net result of that is faster turnaround time. I'm without my broken device for a little bit less time, and that's ultimately one of the one of the best ways we're measured. Um, and and our claims teams have have started to see some of those improvements now as well. Awesome. And now, I mean, your your project or this thing we're talking about wasn't scanning the market for a way to gain 5% of efficiency in all these areas. Your your project was more our system needs to be replaced, I guess, in a way. And what's the best option for that? So cool. Salesforce is it another tool and is CloudWorks a good fit? So, you know, we some customers of ours or some people out there are looking for a way to increase efficiencies or margins or more sales. Um, but obviously you were in choosing a new platform, hoping to get other efficiencies. Um, or, or improvements. What was one of the more surprising ones in terms of the benefit to the to the broader business around that new kind of customer acquisition side? Yeah, so I think one of the like, as with most businesses, um, you know, if if we look at it as a, like a global pool of opportunities that ex that exist um, for us on on the on on the platform, how we're the the speed with which we can get to market for a new opportunity. And the cost of doing so are key drivers for whether we're even going to approach a new or, or even bid for a new opportunity or not. And I'd say with any with any platform and any new deal, we have an element of uh, configuration and then customization. The configuration stuff is boxes that we tick in, in the platform to turn features on and off. And customization is things that we don't have in the toolbox now. We've got to go build some stuff. And the ratio of that configuration to customization makes a big difference as to whether an opportunity is 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 worth it for us or not, and what we've seen, I think, now in the new platform is the there's there's more configuration and less customization to roll out new opportunities, and what that does ultimately is reduces the time to market and the cost to actually turning something on, and what that does is it actually grows the pool of opportunities because the we might have only been looking at the really big ones previously because the cost was so high that the little ones didn't make sense anymore. But as they grow, as, the, as that pool grows, there's more opportunities. And so we're able to bid for stuff that we might not have been able to previously, simply by the fact that um, that the cost of actually turning these things on, of getting the lights on is is now less than it was previously. Yeah, which is amazing. Like as a, as a, your business development team around the world, they've got, well, I can only, you know, our, our target market has gone from this to this because I can now onboard a new range of clients more easily, you know, Jackson and his team in six weeks or two weeks or 10 weeks or whatever are able to do the tick boxes, like you said, config a little bit of customization and, and get someone in. And I think when we first met, that was quite difficult. In fact, the pilot we started with originally going back to the beginning of the story was just because I think that particular opportunity said, if you can't do it in X amount of time, we're not interested. And you said, yeah, we can do it. And and we went ahead and did it. Um, yeah, that, I mean that's a really great story. Uh, and then in terms of the like the translation engine, I guess geographically, you know there are also more 
parts of the world you can work in now too, right? Yeah, so that was, that was a key part of it for us was the fact that um, obviously there's regions where English isn't spoken and um, we're, we're able to translate the entire application, not just the internal application, which is used in, in, in some regions, but all the portals can be translated and have been translated into multiple languages. Um, we've, we've got an engine for translating emails and SMS communications. So all of those things can be, can be sent in local languages. Uh, and that just, again, there's, there's things without that, there's doors that are not open. Uh, and so yeah. the fact that we can do that makes, makes a big difference. Now, as a company that had its own internal team and you built that up over the years, um, both in Australia and other parts of the world, and, and you were iterating on your own platform, um, one of the things that we, you know, wanted to make sure happened over the over the course of our journey that they were uh, upskilled, reskilled, cross-skilled, I guess, and that, you know, Brightside wanted, as they had in the past, to own your own destiny in a way. You wanted to be able to have control over the platform. You wanted to um, be able to co-develop with us mm -hmm. eventually. Um, and as, as of only a few weeks ago, um, really solely developed, I guess, on the platform and you know it sounds counterintuitive to a business like ours a professional services company wanting to work with you but i think it's actually a good news story that in less than two years with this huge replacement of a global program uh, and platform um, you're now self-sufficient uh, and you know a lot of the existing team members uh, are now um, you know salesforce and mulesoft wizards and able to kind of help you enhance and grow the platform um, is have you been surprised that in how quickly and easily the team were able to um, grab those new skill sets and become a, I guess, a functioning squad internally? Yeah, so I get the the, the journey as as you've called it out, Jared. Was you know we've we've got our own internal development teams and have have done so for a number of years. You know, a bunch of really capable, skilled people that have that have worked with us and know our business back to front right so that was a really important resource that um that that we wanted to make sure was con to continuing to be engaged even though the platform was changing uh so mulesoft side we certainly had some um internal experience specifically with mulesoft so that was maybe less of a learning curve but on the salesforce side a lot of a lot of our developers really hadn't had any salesforce experience at all so while we were kind of doing the early phases of the build um with with the cloudworks team fully in charge our internal teams were kind of upskilling and learning and reviewing the work that was being done to get to a point where they started to actually contribute and as time went on that that balance just shifted and and our internal team started to do more and more stuff and we adopted processes and things that we'd learned along the way to the point now where um you know we've made a, a couple of additions to the team but which have all been really um, important for us, um, but now, as you say, we're we're able to to kind of take on that that role of almost being an internal supplier for our customers, like we were previously, but but on Salesforce platform. Yeah, no, it's 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 awesome to see that, and I think a lot of people doubt that that's possible, but no one wants to be vendor locked forever, um, uh, unless there's you know significant new work. But we knew that this would take a year or two, and um, having got there and now, you know, the fun starts, right? You can start really grabbing some of those new innovations and we'll talk about those um, yeah, now. I'd love to just hear like what, you know, clearly you've got to the point where things are getting, you know, like for like with the old solution and maybe a few things still to add. What's exciting you about um, having a platform like Salesforce and and what are you seeing out there, or or what, what's exciting you in the in the new technology world? Obviously, you know, Workfest is a little bit around our our, our AI capability and and data and analytics. But what what's what's making you get excited? Yeah, look, I think there's there's a, there's a few things. So obviously, um, you know, the fact that as a as a team, we're now able to kind of customized to our heart's content and we're seeing all these new features that are being rolled out in the ecosystem that we're that we're able to adopt either ourselves or through further engagement with cloudworks um, where we can where we can make kind of either incremental improvements to our business or or otherwise right obviously there's there's a lot of talk in the space around 
generative AI, and that's something that um, that we're kind of watching pretty closely at the moment. There's a few obvious applications, maybe not obvious, but there's a few applications for that in our business that we're kind of monitoring at the moment to try and understand what what that future could bring for us. But I think the 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 thing for us at the moment is now that we're on this platform, we don't have to do all the work. Previously, we had to do all of the work. Now we're seeing new features getting rolled out all the time. And these features are not even things that we've necessarily even thought about, right? So we're able to see something come along, oops, it's in the next release. And then we can think to ourselves, okay, well, how, can we use that? We're not going to use everything, um, but the reality is those things are available to us. And there's also things that come up that we don't know about that um, we might get a, a message from from you, Jared, or someone else at Cloudworks to say, hey, this feature is coming out, I think is a good fit for you. And that's pretty powerful as well because it gives us um, the opportunity to kind of proactively look at things that we hadn't otherwise thought about. We might think something's perfect for us. Um, well, mm -hmm. We might think something's perfect, but there's actually something else that's better and we don't even know about it. So all of a sudden kind of getting co-opted into that e ecosystem presents opportunities that we didn't think um, we didn't think were possible previously. Yeah, those that know me like know that I like analogies and, and we were talking earlier about the house analogy. Like I just imagine if, I mean, in the same sense of as your Salesforce instance, if your house just randomly got upgraded every like six months or 12 months or in Salesforce case, three months with a new release and you're like, oh, the handles of the doors are better or the flooring now is heated. Like you get this kind of cool, like I wasn't expecting that, but I'll take it. This is great. And maybe not every feature is, is perfectly suited, but you know, you can cherry pick those that you really want to engage with. And I think um, the, some of those generative AI use cases around service, GP service or sales, yeah, definitely we are, are looking forward to exploring those with, with Brightside. Um, we have got some questions, but I've got, a, I've got a, a, one last major one for you, uh, Jackson, and that's looking back over the last couple of years, um, certainly had, had, you know, a lot of late nights and weekends, no doubt, um, as the, as the product owner, I know you took on a lot along with some of our team members, but what are the things that you believe are worthwhile lessons that you'd kind of share with a CIO or a technology lead at a, at a, a similar company um, who is either looking to or has already started an endeavor like this one? Yeah, a couple of things come to mind. I think um, first and foremost, I'd say if, if, if you think you've done enough change management work, you haven't there's 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 always there's always there's no such thing as too much of that right and and certainly um how we had to roll this product out over a number of different regions while still building as we were going you know we had regions that were on the platform that still needed change management for the new features that were being deployed even after they'd gone live right so it was this big kind of this tr moving train of delivery along the way uh and so um, you know, it's 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 hard work when you're dealing with people in multiple regions and time zones to kind of get that change management stuff right. I, I think in in retrospect, we could have done more. We did we did as best we could, um, but there's always more to be done on on that front. Um, and and certainly, uh, when you're on the journey we're all the way along, it's hard to put yourself in the shoes of someone who is a user of the platform that hasn't been on the journey. Uh, and so that's that's really tricky. Uh, I'd say. If you're gonna, if there's a data migration um, that needs to be done, then it will keep you up at night, no, no matter what you do. Um, that was, you know, if 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 you get that wrong, that's when things can go pear shaped. And we worked really, really hard. It was like a whole separate um, channel of work through the whole project, just on the data migration to get that right. And we had a pretty much a separate team working on that. Uh, and that evolved as well. Every release, there's new components for the data migration. So it had to go iterate, iterate, iterate. So that was tricky as well. Probably the last thing I reckon would be uh, having an idea of what you want to look like at the end as a team, right? And then kind of probably communicating that with a, with a partner if you have one. So I think, you know, like we've said throughout the course of this call, um, knowing uh, that we wanted to be able to do our own thing and telling you guys that early on was probably really important because it sort of shaped the relationship so that everyone knew what the goal was um, just, just from a final capability perspective. And that was really important to us. And I think that might not be everyone's jam, right? Like you might not want that, but at least knowing what you want 
at the end is very helpful um, at the beginning. That's a good point because I, I think we got about halfway through the, the the course of the journey, and you guys started to co-own or, or even own certain streams of work. And now Tim, like, well, the bright side guys are doing this over here, and we're doing this over here, and they had to merge the streams. You know, the release management, the DevOps processes became a bit more of a challenge. However, in those moments, it might feel harder. Where we are today, it's better because you are now um, owning, we talked about owning your own destiny now. And I think that for us as a partner, we want to have that flexibility. We want to be able to offer that type of service, especially for these larger programs where you've got an internal team because I think in the long run, that's better. That's a um, more sustainable way of doing this kind of work. Yeah, it was de- there were there were definitely some some tricks along the way with that, and the the key thing is we couldn't we couldn't do that at the expense of the the kind of productivity of the CloudWorks team, right? So we couldn't slow the that build down, but we still needed to get to the end and have something that we could take over, right? And so it was just mm. getting that mix right that was that was important, but I think we did a pretty good job of that. Um, Reese, should I go through some of these questions coming from the audience? Yeah, do you think, mate? That sounds good, mate. I've got one really quick one here. From yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, saying they're a small bank and they always talk about giving their teams the same data as their their customers have, and they're just interested in what the actual impact was to your business. You've got an extra link in the chain. You've got your customers, customers, your customers, and then your team. Um, how did that impact? you as a company with with having everyone being able to sing off the same uh him sheet i think yeah i think you probably speak to to most people uh at any time anytime there's any there's any uncertainty about a source of truth things tend things tend to get messy right so um when we if we've got two versions of data in two different locations on two different systems and one says five and the other one says ten we don't, we don't necessarily know what what what's right there, you know, uh, and so that a, a lot of not that that happened a, a huge amount to us, but but when it did, it was really challenging, uh, and we've found now that that um, that's certainly something that um, is is infrequent to non-existent now. Um, you know, having said that, you've also got to be a little bit careful in that process of um, ensuring that the the right data goes to the right people. Yes, it's all centralized. Um, but making sure that the, the, those records are shared properly. Um, we did a lot of work early on in some of the built-in Salesforce features around um, sharing rules to make sure that the right records were shared even internally across our regions, but then mm. um, not being visible for certain external stakeholders where they where they could have been. And also things like field level security, where you can actually specify that individual fields are only accessible by by certain individual profiles and roles. And that those those things kind of plugging them together, um, you know. That's I think that's often why those that data is segregated physically to make sure that that doesn't happen. But those baked in kind of platform features um, in limited um, any likelihood of exposure that that we needed to avoid. Um, so certainly there was it's a, it's a good question, isn't it? Because that's something we actually forgot to mention as part of the baked in Salesforce features and and some of the add-on products that you guys have got around privacy and security for, for financial services organizations is they, you know, they have those settings. Yeah. Um, that we, you can then configure. Yeah, we, we, we are one of the, not to go too far down the rabbit hole, but we, we deployed the, the Salesforce shield platform, which allows us to have field level security, which was, you know, question. It's always a question in a, in a security self-assessment. And so being able to tick those boxes um, made that process a, um, it's a process, but it was smoother than it had been previously by being able to just turn features on um, because they were they were native to the platform. And, and being, you know, working across Europe and other country, uh, other other regions, having a platform like Salesforce that has GDPR settings baked into it obviously helps. Um, whereas something custom might um, struggle to adopt those things. Um, sorry, Reese. No, you're oh, good, back, back to you. You got, you got the next uh, question. There, yeah. So? Yeah, so one of them was someone's picked up that your multi-region, multi-client, multi-language, multi-feature, you know, and you had this big set thing going to the next thing, I guess. Um, so how did you break up the rollout of this, you know, you know, it sound, obviously 
not going live in a big bang how did you what was the the cut yeah good question I think the so ultimately we 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 chose to adopt it region by region so each of the region we and we prioritize those regions based on the functionality that they required right so the region that required the least customization went first followed by the next one followed by the next one because then it meant that we were kind of just building as we were going so we had the rollout projects happening with the customization projects in order to kind of sequence that correctly um there are you know there were some challenges with that because we do do some cross-regional stuff as well so if a, if a customer moves internationally then sometimes their cover is transferable and so we did have some scenarios through that journey where you've got a customer in in the old system but they actually need to uh, process in the new system so that was a bit of a challenge um, but that's pretty infrequent so we we dealt with that so that was our, our sequencing region by region um, I think it was the right way to do it for us because it also meant that's typically the way the call centers and the service agent networks are organized so we didn't want to have a situation where our service agent um, had to deal with transactions in two systems at the same time and so that was that was one of the kind of decisions that we made that we said let's break it down that way um, so for the most part, everyone is only dealing with one system at the at, at one time. Yeah, because I remember the biggest region, which will go nameless, was the last one. But by the time you got to it, you built eighty percent or something of what that needed, and it it didn't feel like so much of a mountain if you had it gone with them first, right? Yeah, look, I think it's 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 one of those things where the the largest region had the largest amount of customization as well. So it was kind of the the culmination of everything. Um, but there were it, it wasn't didn't didn't make it a piece of cake by any stretch but it was but it was but it was certainly that was that was helpful because we we're also kind of in a way semi semi piloting some of those new features these features were actually stress tested in some of the smaller regions earlier um, yeah. through, um so so it wasn't like a cold deploy with everything brand new all at the same time there was certainly some new stuff that went in for the final for the final launches but a lot of stuff that we'd already done previously that we knew worked because it had been running in production for, for many months. Um, okay, I've got another one, which I think is talking about um, customizations and, and you mentioned your existing system was really good, but needed, needed replacing. Um, what are you glad, in terms of all the priorities you could have focused on, what are you glad you focused on? And then what was the things that you couldn't focus on initially and what was the cost of that? Yeah, so you know what? Like, a, 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 I can't even sort of speak to specific features, um, but I think the one thing that was the most important thing was getting the data model right, um, right from the very outset. You know, we're trying to build something that we know is going to scale with us, and if you get your data model wrong, that is just hard work from from the outset, right? So we spent a, a significant amount of time both internally, kind of soul searching to try and get that right and then kind of passing that back and forth between ourselves and cloudworks to see that um to see that we'd gotten that right and for the most part i think that we did um and i think you probably that's something i would never recommend under investing on because you get it back without having to redo stuff throughout the journey because you got that right from the outset so some of that real foundational stuff is important as far as things that uh that we struggled with um, certainly, you know, I would, I would observe that, uh, a significant percentage of the features that we had in our existing platform are in the new platform and they're, uh, incrementally better, which was, which was one of our measures of success. There are some things that aren't quite as developed. Uh, and so there was probably some areas that we could have given a bit more attention to, but what we've found is now they're on platform. We're trying to incrementally improve those as well to get them um, ahead of where they were previously um, so certainly you know some areas that we that we got right some areas that we're never getting get them all right but some of them that we can still improve on um, but but absolutely that that initial foundational work of getting the model right is really key mm. um, looking back two years are you glad that you did this project not personally because i know that you you are you're only 20 years old look and and you know been a long two years but is a business um happy 
Yeah, we we, had to, we 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 had to do this, right? Like I think at the at the end of the day, um, we were in a position where uh, the platform, as we knew it, was becoming progressively less stable, and so it was a thing. It was a thing that that needed to happen, as well as opening doors that um, that were, as I said before, previously closed to us. Um, but I think that was, you know, it was it was a hard slog, and I think certainly uh some challenges for everyone it touched everyone across the business the the platform that we replaced was effectively the central nervous system of brightside right so everything connected to it or or relied on it in some way and everyone's going to have a system like that al along the way um and it needed to be replaced it was probably something that we we knew needed to be replaced for a while we just didn't really have the right kind of plan and and action as to how to do it timing worked out um that we that we stumbled across cloudworks and um everything kind of came together and we were able to do it so certainly had its challenges um but it was it was a necessary thing and I'm, I'm really glad we did it i like this question and it's uh, i'm sure we've stuffed up across the last couple of years with you a number of times and we're not close to perfect but we're still talking so that's a good sign um what makes a good partner so we've talked about sort of the platform a lot, but what, what do you think, make, now that you've done this for a little while, what do you think are the most important things um, in a partner relationship, Salesforce partner relationship? Probably uh, getting, a, getting someone that will actually get into the weeds and try and figure you out. Every business is unique and has its own, has its own quirks. We... Um, and we're certainly not immune to that, but I think um, what we found from that initial engagement onwards, um, Jared, was that um, the, the, the Cloudworks team members that we worked with tended to, to get us and understood where we were coming from and where we wanted to go. Um, certainly in the early days, it was probably pretty heavy touch because there was a lot of stuff we didn't know. Um, but then as we kind of progressed on our own journey, um, I think our engagement with you guys changed a bit as well because you kind of adapted to our changes and 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 that worked out pretty well too. So, look, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, there's there's a there's a finite number of CRM platforms out there that that will do the job, and um, and, a, and a potentially a large number of partners that you could work with. Um, making sure you get that fit right and 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 trusting people. Um, to make some pretty big decisions on your behalf is a bit scary. Um, but if you find the right people, then then it's not quite so scary. Uh, and that's that's what we found. So we've got like three minutes left. Reese, have we got time for one more question or is we're going to get wrapped up? Into a, a real quick question. Then we've got a quick wrap up with a bit of a QR code for joining the, uh, the keynote on Thursday. Yeah, cool. Okay, Jackson. Uh, who are you going for tomorrow night in the rugby? Uh, I will be supporting Queensland as as I should. Okay. That, that... Um, someone someone in the audience obviously knows you from Queensland because that's um, I think an excuse to talk about our rivalry. I'm saving uh, this is this is the Tuesday blue right but it, but we'll uh we'll, we'll go in the wash never to be seen for the next 24 hours <laughs> well, i'm an afl guy so i was about to say tonight um, but uh, you know what is the game on i guess i don't know <laughs> news to me um thanks jackson that was really great i appreciate you making time today and, and time to prepare for today as well in your busy schedule um yeah it's uh hope, yeah, i think we're still mates looking forward to live to fight another day our next beer together. Um, over you, Reese. Hundred percent. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the chat and appreciate the insights. Yeah, just finally, um, we do have a keynote on Thursday at four thirty. We'd love everyone to join. Um, thanks for joining today, and um, yeah, look forward to working with you more, Jackson, and um, yeah, working with the people that joined the call. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.